ability to intervene in Syria and other countries which are well armed and the only way to do that is through hard power. Also the missile defence shield which the US has been trying to get uh, Europe to do and also has now included Russia which Russia was a staunch opponent of the missile defence shield as it saw it as a direct threat and even threatened to attack military radar installations in Poland and uh, other places in Eastern Europe uh, and also it still feels chagrin at any move by the Georgia especially or the Ukraine to move in to um, NATO or even the European Union even though Russia is making openings to try and enter the European Union which is what I've hoped you should never underestimate the Russians. The Hitler did to his eternal uh, cost and um, you know his own destruction. Uh, the Russians are a hardy people. They have a have a, a good culture, uh, outstanding culture in some respects, uh, in folklore and in um, and in uh, the musical plays and literature that they've produced. Uh, but they are still a, 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 a people who've suffered barbarianism and poverty. And so, therefore, to take on Russia will be the biggest project of the European Union that's ever had to face. Um, and we have to do some, somehow to get Russia to decrease its military Keynesianism because it spends an inordinate amount of money on its military, as it did during the Soviet era, when the Russia was a subject of the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union was spending 15% of its GDP on weapons. So, you can see the arguments for or against military Keynesianism, but I would argue that if the Europe is to be able to be recognised as the preeminent military power. And maybe it doesn't want to be. Maybe it wants to be seen as the premier economic hyperpower, which is able to project its economic power across the world. And that you like they said about McDonald's and Coca-Cola being the first signs of American imperialism, maybe the first signs of a European dominance over the globe is that Chinese are buying Mercedes cars and other things, and the troops really do come in at the last moment. That is a good strategy. It worked for the Americans during the 1950s, um, where their economic power was almost, a military power was almost Roman in power. Um, and as Noel Ferguson said, you know, the Americans saw the Europeans after in the 1950s and even today as military wimps but they're a handy place to uh, have have bases and things especially when you want to intervene in the middle, middle East but Europe has to steer its own course here Europe needs a European armed forces European carriers which are able to be equal to the Americans if not better um, we need to be a maritime hyperpower, as I said in the West Mark, why we need a Western world. And I'm treading on that territory of that video there, but um, we do need uh, eventually a Western currency for all the Western countries um, so that we are big enough to face off against China to invade Saudi Arabia if need be, if the revolution there doesn't work. Um, with OPEC having the ability to spend vast amounts of money on its military um, because of its trillion uh, dollar after tax um, profits, then you know we're facing against the oil ol oligarchs here. Well, the Europeans are trying to go for uh, clean energy better industrial relations, better industrial uh, output and also a better military uh, balance of forces. The, you can't, cannot simply have a brilliant economy and no military uh, 
ability to project force. Um, the Persians and Chinese in their age in their age did this same thing. The Indians did it, where they produced everything in in the world that people could want, and this was a tempting. Um, tempting uh, target for people like the Mongols who did everything that they could to produce a military culture and a military ability that, to project force. There wasn't many of them, but they projected force. Now, because their society was completely militarised. Also, the other German states during the time of uh, Alf, um, Frederick the Great were tempting targets because Prussia was a military, secular um, uh, state which had very low living standards um, but had a good ethics and a good military and it was tempting for them to take over the more industrialised parts of Germany. So we've seen two examples of this in this video although there are many others in history and of course the Indians didn't learn from their lesson, the Persians didn't learn from their lesson, the Chinese didn't learn from their lesson, and not only were they conquered by the Mongols, they were conquered later by the British Empire, which assumed everyone else and became the global hyperpower. In fact, if any any empire having just having over a quarter of the world's surface and a quarter of the world's population ever came close to completely dominating the world, it was the British Empire. But as Niall Ferguson said, the, the Americans weren't good at, pro, at pro, projecting um, people and colonising other countries. And so they developed an informal empire with puppet client states. So they were good at military Keynesianism, the Americans. It was what saved their economy during World War Two by producing a, a surplus of military forces. But it is what is destroying their empire now, because weapons are a sunk cost. Every time you produce a weapon, somebody else produces a better weapon or a better defence against that weapon. So, therefore, that is the poison chalice of military Keynesianism. But you do need to, uh, to grasp the grail of military Keynesianism so to speak, on the positive side, to have a defence of your civilization and to be able to expand your civilization, And that's the lesson that the Europeans need to learn. So I'm being a bit hard on the Europeans this time, but I am very pro-European. I do want Europe to be a global hyperpower to dominate, and the world to be dominated by Europeans in the most widest sense of the term. Um, those people who believe in life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, economic and social rights, uh, the values of the European Union, the United States and Canada and the Western world, wider Western world. Um, and that's what this this video is in defence of. But Robert Gates himself has given thrown his uh, torch into the into the fire to make it blaze and make us think about what's going on. And because he's coming to the end of his term, he's able to speak freely. And this is something that a democracy has a military advantage in, because with dictatorships, there's always yes-men. And with bureaucracies, there's always yes-men who want to keep their jobs. And that's why, as, the, as Colonel Gaddafi is finding out, as Saddam Hussein found out, and as maybe um, Bashir Assad will find out eventually, that... Being a dictator actually makes you a military weakling and you're only able to subdue your people for some time before a foreign power, an outlander power like the EU and the United States comes in and stops you. Now, um, will this happen? Are, are we able to intervene in, um, in uh, Syria? I would like us to. I would like us to invade Saudi Arabia. They're both feudalistic crime families. They both need to go. Um, European Union is six million men under arms in various in the air force, navy, and army. If only this power could be brought together under one single command and utilized effectively within NATO and the United States, then we would have be a military hyperpower.